a minute. Okay, now that's, that's premise number one. Premise number two is that uh, performers, that very same performer that was emitting all those arrows a few minutes ago, exists in a mystical thing which I call a performance system. And uh, but that, if you take in the recognition that they exist in such a thing, there's a lot of power in sorting out what we can do with training, what we can't do with training, and what we, in fact, uh, have to do to support our particular training. Now, let me just quick ask, how many people have seen this picture before? Okay. Good. Yes. <laughs> we won't eat lunch today in order to be sure to stay awake. Uh, excuse me. One of the things about performance systems is they frequently go out of focus. Okay, let's take a couple minutes to talk about this because it's 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 a key way. You know, people have talked about things called deficiencies of knowledge versus deficiencies of execution, and uh, Bob Mager talks about separating training problems from non-training problems, etc. Uh, this is supportive of that. This I just find to be a useful framework to get in your heads to, to uh, listen to training problems with and also to teach managers to, to look at what they do a little differently. It says the following, that you can look at any organization performance in this way, that you've got a performer that in some given occasion has a, a signal or they want the performer to take some action, make a decision, do something. Uh, and that's your basic stimulus response hookup. Also, we know that for any response that a performer takes or makes and or doesn't take or make, there's some consequence to that performer of making that response. All right? Um, that is pretty straightforward. So key point number one is behavior is influenced by its consequences. Basically, people don't do things that lead to negative consequences, and they do those things that lead to positive consequences. All right? It's fundamental. Uh, to the world. It's important to understand here that we're talking about a consequence to the performer for making the response, not necessarily a consequence to the organization. That's an important distinction because organizations think about the consequences to themselves, not to the people. So they'll say things like, Diane, if you don't put the widget on the framus properly, in three weeks the framus is going to fall off. Well, the framus falling off in three weeks is a consequence to the organization. It frequently ain't no skin off Diane's knows. Uh, in fact, organizations are no dummies. They know if they can ship it within two weeks, it's not even going to be a consequence to them. Um, that's, that's some kind of consequence downstream here to the organization. What we're concerned about are the consequences in the immediate performance system of Diane. Because if she puts, takes time to put the widget on the framus, that means that she's not going to be able to do two other things, get out a management report, and get to the carpool in time. And those are the kinds of consequences that have a lot to do with whether people do anything or not. So that's what we're concerned about. And then uh, uh, fifth, the feedback on those consequences. Some information coming back to the performer saying, here's what's, what's happening. Now, I would argue that all performance can be looked at as part of that five-part system. And point number two is that poor performance can result from a breakdown in one or more of the components of the performance system. Now, it's a, our, it tends to be management's favorite myth that when you don't get the response you want, that's a function of the performer. Either they don't give a damn or they don't know how to do it right. And that's, of course, how so many of our training programs get, uh, get introduced. And uh, I would argue that, from my experience, uh, aside from just initial training, about 80% of the time when you don't get the response you want is for some reason other than you've got a bum performer. So that leads to the conclusion that when we play this game, we usually give the performer the benefit of the doubt. When we don't get the performance we want, where we're going to tend to operate is on the assumption we've got a good performer and let's look for someplace else to see where the system has broken down. And point number three, this puts the performer in, I don't know if it's proper perspective, but it puts the performer in perspective with the environment. You, as far as I'm concerned, you cannot take performers out of their performance system and abstract and deal with them and bend them around, which is what a lot of training is all about. Uh, let's give me a quick part, you know, quick uh, example of that. Um, my favorite example. Situation is the following. 
airline passenger has three bags walks up to the ticket agent that's the performer in question the airline has a very simple request they wish the ticket agent to make on those circumstances and it's basically excuse me but you can check two of those bags for free but I'm going to have to charge you two dollars excess baggage charge for the third bag pretty simple organizations are filled full of such wonderful requests okay makes sense now there are going to be some consequences to the performer of doing that uh, to our ticket agent of saying two dollars please uh, the source of that consequence the most immediate consequence is going to be who what's the source customer now a customer could make a number of responses and uh, under those circumstances um, things like you know God damn, great. You know, I had some extra change I wanted to get rid of, so uh, when I go through the, um, the uh, security machine, it won't tag it off. You know, it's a system that they use in Mexico City with the airport tax. You know, oh, you still got 100 pesos? It's the airport tax. Uh, well, there's this range of possible consequences that, that uh, could come to our ticket agent at this point. You know, I suspect that they're going to tend to be more on the order of, you what? You want $2 more? I just paid $840 round trip on this goddamn airline, and now you want to charge me $2 excess baggage charge? What kind of a chicken outfit do you work for, and who's your supervisor? Okay. That's for openers. Now, it's conceivable that that kind of a response from the customer would register as a negative consequence for the ticket agent. Okay. And if I happen to be the customer, I work hard at setting it up that way. Now, if this ticket agent persists in this foolishness after that first round, uh, of response, we've got another consequence, which is very typical of the consequences we set up in organizations inadvertently, all right? Now, you know and I know that there's no way that an organization in a civilized world can handle an influx of $2 cash without filling out at least one five-part form. Can't do it. One, $2 might not get into the cash register if we didn't fill out the form. Probably more significantly, if the $2 got into the cash register without the supporting paperwork, the accounting department would spend $1,500 trying to find out where the $2 came from. All right? So regardless of the reason, you've got to fill out the five-part form. Now, based on your experience, just think about it. Do you think that the forms necessary to handle this transaction are stacked neatly in great abundance at each workstation at the old ticket counter? Unlikely. Got to find the damn thing. All right. Who's got form 583? No, it's not 583 anymore. This year's 594. Well, anybody got it? Get it back. Come back. Two or three minutes are going by now. If your customer wasn't upset initially, now they're getting that way. Plus, the people behind the customer are backing up, and the noise is going up. Language is going up. Ticket agents hearing language they never heard in a training form. Really? You can do that, huh? Yeah. So, uh, I have to tell Martha. Huh? So, they're, you know, now we've got to fill out the form. Uh, name, rank, serial number, height, weight, etc. Handle the transaction at $2. By this time, you know, it ain't good. I mean, uh, that's a second consequence, fairly negative. At this point, there's a third consequence. Doesn't always happen, but it happens just enough. That's the fact that the back door opens up behind the ticket counter. My experience is, you know, there's usually two unmarked doors. You're standing at the ticket counter, and uh, you're waiting. Look, it's, it's pretty Eastern Airlines, and you're it's eight minutes to boarding time, and you're four people away from, from the, uh, the ticket counter. And uh, the door opens up, and you say, oh, thank God, it's help, you know. And it's usually someone comes up with a cup of coffee in their hand. They kind of stagger out, and they take a look at the long line. It's sort of like the, the great figurine Swiss clocks. And they come out one door, see there's work to be done, and go right back in the other door. <laughs> Clank. Okay. Well, in this case, the door opens up, and it's not your ordinary folk. It's the supervisor. The supervisor looks out and sees this long line backing up across the lobby and says, what in hell is going on? Goes to the head of the line and says, excuse me, Bill, uh, what's the problem? Because, ah, I caught this so-and-so trying to slip two bucks past the company here. Oh, well, now we got a chance for the supervisor to make a response. You know, it's a wide range of possible responses. You know, could be, gee, Bill, that's terrific. Vigilance is next to cleanliness, which is next to godliness. It's highly valued in our organization. Unlikely. The response is going to be more skewed along the end of our Christ's sake. Take the form, tear it up, give the two bucks back to the customer, have the, the uh, sky cap come down, hand carry the customer down to the gate, and uh, turn around, go back in the little door, mumbling something about lowered hiring standards, EEO compliance, and where's the training department when I need them, kind of thing. All right? So that about does it. The ticket agent has had it. Uh, what kind of information is coming back to our ticket agent on those consequences? I mean, it's 
it's dynamite in ed feeney would love it it's direct it's immediate it's frequent it's specific and it all says you got to be crazy to collect for excess baggage charges in this organization but maybe there's help down here we got to have some organizational consequences um, probably because they're making me go through all this aggravation of collecting two dollars is maybe there's some information that's going to come back to the ticket agent that could offset what's just happened in the immediate performance system maybe there's some information that comes back that says here's how you're doing against the month's plan for excess baggage charges or here's how you're doing this month against last month or here's how you're doing national Washington National against LaGuardia against O'Hare etc cetera, etc cetera. okay sorry no information airline doesn't track excess baggage charges so that kind of ends our little our little performance system of the ticket agent okay Poor performance can result from a breakdown in one or more of the components. Why is the ticket agent not doing it? Because they're bad, malicious, poorly trained. They're doing it because the performance system says it doesn't make any sense to do that. Uh, now, that well and good, ticket agent probably isn't going to do that. In fact, they don't even see excess baggage anymore. You know, the uh, sky cap can wheel up with a cart stacked to the ceiling. And, uh, you know, just check those babies through because it's too much aggravation. We've got a balance of consequences set up so that people have got to be crazy to do what they've been told they're supposed to do. Now, where the rub comes for most organizations is that the ticket agent forgets it and everybody else forgets it and we're business as usual, except in this case, the vice president of marketing for the airline comes whipping through Newark Airport someday and uh, sitting there waiting for a plane because there aren't any planes that fly out of Newark anymore. And, uh, notices that ticket agents are letting people get on the airplanes without the appropriate amount of corporate hassle, i.e. they're not being charged for excess baggage charges. So this really offends the vice president of marketing. So he or she gets on the airplane, got a little time to kill, so they write a memo to the vice president of operations with a copy to the vice president of personnel, making an observation about what they just saw in the field. Okay, now again, we have a wide range of possible responses here, but I will lay you apples to donuts that what the vice president of marketing is going to say in the way of a description is something like the following. I was in the field and I observed that ticket agents, here's, here's the critical thing, that ticket agents don't know how to collect for excess baggage charges. Now, but, you know, it wouldn't, you know, it would, a service it would be if they would just say, I was in the field and I observed that ticket agents aren't collecting excess baggage charges, eh? but no, you can't raise a problem in organizations without proposing a solution. So I was in the field and I observed that ticket agents don't know how to collect excess baggage charges. Same problem, didn't see this, assume it's this. So the vice president of personnel gets the memo, doesn't look good, calls up the training director. Says, Bill, would you come in here please? Talk to me about this. Uh, we got a problem here. Bill says, no, sorry. And our three-week introductory training course for new ticket agents, second Tuesday, 9 to 12, we cover excess baggage charges, and I got it on videotape. Nah, 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 nah. Okay. And the vice president of personnel says, I never really trusted that media crap anyhow. Nothing like a good stand-up instructor. And uh, whatever you're doing in training, it's not working. And what I want you to do is to get on your white horse or silver bird, whatever you use, and I want you to get out in the field, and I want you to retrain, refresher train, whatever, okay? Every time I hear the, the re in front of a re training request, it sends off a little performance system alarm uh, running up or down my spine. And uh, so now a training program is born. And so the training department goes out, and what are we doing? What are we saying here? This is the, this is the, the important third point. Okay? What we're saying is the performer isn't performing properly, supposedly. The, the faulty component, well, that's point number two, really. The faulty component in our performance system is the person, is the performer. Thereby, they must be repaired. So what we're going to do is take them out of the real performance system, and we're going to send them off to the repair department. Okay? And who's the repair department? The you know, human performance repair department. That's us guys, right? So we got them now. We got them out of the context, and what do we do? Be mildly facetious, you know. We say, well, 
Gotta train them. We gotta retrain them here. What are we gonna do? Depending on your budget, you use four by six cards or video vignettes, and you, you know, we put together kind of the S prime because it's it's not the performance system. It's done in training, not the real one. We simulate it. Say we show them a picture of a passenger. Say what is that? They say passengers. Very good. It's not a visual discrimination problem. How many bags do they have? Three. Well, it's not a counting deficiency. We're moving right along. Smarter class than I thought. Maybe they don't know what they do when they see one of those. Okay. What do you do? Unison. Gotcha. Good. Two dollars of your life. Okay. And we go through all that, and the consequences are very positive in our training situation, and the feedback is very immediate and direct, etc. And God, in just a matter of a few short days, people knew what they did when they came in. All right. One thing we've gained is that we can certify that they've been trained. We put a tag on their toe and we send them back in the performance system. Well, the organization has not changed the standards in any way. They haven't said, hey, maybe it ain't too smart to have our ticket agents collect for excess baggage charges between 5 and 8 p.m. on Fridays and Sundays at O'Hare, Washington National, and Kennedy. Because, in fact, if they really did it, they'd bring the whole place, you know, shut the whole place down worse than an air controller strike. All right? They haven't done that. They haven't changed the resources. They haven't changed the form in some way to facilitate the trainee doing what we want them to do. Haven't changed the consequences in any way. And we argue, what are we going to do about passenger? They're outside our domain. We can't control that. That's baloney. Some airlines do a very good job of managing the customer. So the customer knows 15 minutes and 500 feet in advance that this is going to happen. And there are no support surprises. And the ticket agent doesn't get dumped on. All right, That's a possibility. If we can't, in fact, control our supervisors to keep them from coming out and dumping on our employees, then we should be out of business. I mean, my God. But we haven't done any of that stuff. And now we take our fully trained, ticket, retrained ticket agent, and we shove them back in that performance system. And everyone is amazed in six weeks when they've once again contracted the terminal case of the dumbs or whatever. Okay. So the performance system, in my mind, is a way of positioning any performer in terms of trying to understand what else is operating, of asking some questions and saying, hey, what's not there that should be there, and separating training from non-training. But the other thing is, if we're going to train, understanding that these other pieces have got to be in place. Because if there's any one thing out of whack in the performance system, we ain't going to get it. We ain't going to get it. Now. If you get you to believe that there's such a thing as a performance system, then you ought to be able to get you to believe that we could probably specify the characteristics of an ideal performance system. And in fact, you know we can. There's nothing new on here, except that we, you know, I'm, there's a, for some reason, the characteristics on feedback didn't make the, the cut here, but uh, basically that it has to be specific and frequent and immediate. But we know that, right? We know all there is to get performance in an organization. That we know all there is to manage performance or to engineer performance in an organization. But in fact, what we do in most organizations is wish for performance. So what this says here is if you really want performance management, this is what you got to do. This is the ideal. Damn it all. If you want people to collect for excess baggage charges, it ain't no big secret about how to get them to do that. You got to have these things in place. To the extent you don't have those things in place, you're unlikely to get excess baggage charges collected. It's as simple as that. All right. Well, it's as simple as that conceptually. It's tough in organizations because we've got ourselves in a mentality of kind of programs, which is when something doesn't happen, we assume there's one thing wrong. If we can find the one program for it, you know, we can send them off to get that program and they all come back. Where, in fact, what we've got to do in organizations is keep some balance in that performance system. And I would argue that that's what's important for managers to be able to do, is to be able to manage the performance system. Not manage people, but manage the performance system. Because so much of the, of the people problems in organization is a function of these other components being out of whack and people just trying to survive. Now